Good afternoon. You're joining us live from Ithaca, New York, home of Cornell University. I'm Perdita Das Humphrey. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Assistant Dean of Hans Beta House here at Cornell. I'm joined by Dr. Julie Shackford Bradley, co-founder and director of the Restorative Justice Center, University of California, Berkeley, and Dr. Amy Mealy, Associate Dean of Students and Director for Student Affairs for Compliance in Title IX at Rutgers University. We are so glad you have joined us for this great hour of programming we have put together to discuss restorative practices and the Title IX process, successes and challenges. We will begin by taking a moment to reflect the land we are currently on. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayogono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayogono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayogono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayogono people past and present to these lands and waters. So this eCornell keynote series came out of a group of staff and faculty members at Cornell, led by Jeff Godowski, who were engaging around topics of restorative justice for the past three years. A common desire to learn from other institutions led to the creation of this series. Today's topic is particularly close to my heart, and I cannot wait to learn more from our esteemed panelists. So without further ado, I'm going to pose the first question, um, and this is coming to you, Julie, and then Amy. Please tell us a little about your background and a general overview of what's happening on each of your campuses regarding the intersections of restorative justice and practices and the Title IX processes. Thank you, Amy. I'm sorry. Thank you, Perdita. <laughs> Um, yeah, my name is Julie Shackford Bradley. I'm the director of the Restorative Justice Center here at UC Berkeley. And we started our um, center in about 2012. At the time, I was a faculty member and I got interested in restorative justice. Um, in the it came kind of came to the Bay Area and Oakland. Uh, through some activists and um, organizers. And so we all did the training and then we started to think about how we could do this at uh, on campus. And um, so uh, right around the time that we were building out the RJ Center in 2014 and 2015, uh, there was a lot of activism around the country and particularly on our campus around um, sexual violence and the sense that the campus was not um, taking it seriously and that people uh, felt unsafe. Um, and so um, in, you know, along with that campus organizing, the RJ Center really wanted to take this on and see how we could offer an option for uh, restorative responses for sexual harm. And we also participated in national organizing around that. Um, and we also really wanted to think about community building practice as a way of um, promoting prevention of sexual violence. So we brought that into our um, work as well. And um, so up to the present day, we will, I'll talk more later about our relationships with different campus groups and with into Title IX off the Title IX office. But I would say that um, we have we do cases for of sexual violence, um, sexual harm, and also gender harms uh, through the RJ Center in uh, independently of other campus um, structures. Um, and these days, we're actually doing a lot more work around racial harm because that is more of the uh, focus on campus uh, currently. Thank you. If I can just um, do a quick clarification or even a follow up, um, are, are, does your center focus more on restorative justice, like practices after harm has caused or uh, just processes, or do you also have like uh, proactive practices? Yeah, so uh, our center, a lot of the work that we do involves community building workshops. And so we really do want people to take that first step, what's called tier one in RJ, to get together, to get to know each other, 
um, to build relationships, whether it's on teams or, you know, staff teams or in living spaces or even in classrooms. Um, and, and that way it's a little bit, uh, easier to come in and do the restorative response if conflict or harm occurs. Um, also student organizations and, and other spaces. And we have a team of undergrads that do the work with their peers and also a team of grad students that do the work with their grad student peers. Um, so that is, that is really our focus. Um, but then we do also respond to, uh, we offer services in response to conflict and harm. Thank you so much. Um, Amy? Sure. So again, my name is Dr. Amy Mealy. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Title IX coordinator on the Rutgers New Brunswick campus here in New Jersey. Um, so similar to Julie um, at Rutgers, we, we use all three tiers of restorative justice. So everyone, of course, should focus mostly in tier one with community building and preventative work. So we do a lot of restorative justice circles. Um, we have celebration circles and healing spaces and lots of different types of um, practices that fall within tier one. We also do use tier two responding to harm um, for cases involving sexual violence um, and also bias incidents, student conduct incidents separate from the Title IX office. Um, and we have started using um, or dipping our toe, I would say, into tier three, um, which is focused on re-entry. So for students who took a leave for whatever reason and are now returning, we are incorporating restorative practices um, to re-integrate um, them into the community. So as far as what the intersection between RJ and Title IX looks like, here at Rutgers, um, whenever we receive a report of sexual misconduct, and that could be sexual harassment, assault, dating, domestic violence, stalking, anything related, we first speak with the um, complainant or the person who experienced the harm and give them options. So I'm sure the audience knows about a formal investigation process. Under Title IX, you're also required to have an informal, we like to call it an alternative process. Um, and we offer a menu of different options that are based in restorative practices for complainants um, or harmed parties to choose from. It's entirely voluntary, but uh, we do have a lot of respondents um, or the person who's caused harm uh, want to sign on. Um, many times, and again, we'll get into this later, but many times the students are feeling remorseful and want to be able to resolve it in a way um, where both parties are feeling like, you know, their questions are answered and it's aiding in their healing. And so many of which result in this informal or alternative process. Um, we have also done restorative justice conferencing, um, where facilitators are bringing the parties into the same room or virtual space together to discuss the incident um, of all types. So um, I threw a lot of information out there, but I know we'll get into more specifics as we go. Yeah, and actually part of that question, and this is for both of you, uh, before we go into the specifics, I would also, um, and I'm sure the audience would also just would love to live, learn a little bit more about you individually, so a little bit about your backgrounds as well. Um, so Julie, if you um, want to talk a little bit about like how you came into this work and what kind of motivates you to engage in this work, that would be lovely. And then um, Amy, I'll go over to you. Yeah, thank you for that question, Perdita. Um, well, like I said, I started out as faculty and uh, my uh, area was peace and conflict studies. And so I was very interested in how people around the world utilize what's called community-based justice or traditional justice, even before I started knowing about restorative justice in the United States. And um, especially after major incidents of um, harm that in the form of, you know, uh, violent conflict. Um, and so I was seeing things in, in different, uh, seeing practices in different parts of the world 
um, and they had a lot of similarities. And so when I did uh, get introduced to restorative justice, I I really uh, resonated with it. You know, the idea that a person can take accountability when they have done harm and the world is not going to fall down on them or, you know, they're not going to be put into prison uh, for the rest of their life. Um, they're not going to be shunned um, by their community, but rather they're embraced and invited to think about how they can repair that harm uh, just really resonates with me. Um, and at the same time, thinking about how people who have experienced harm uh, are held by their communities, are, you know, um, given the opportunity to think through what their needs are and uh, validated in their experiences. And, and, and um, that community piece to me is really important um, to think about how people come together and figure it out together and when I'm in now, when I'm doing this work on campus for, you know, faculty um, groups or staff groups, I introduce it by saying, you know, RJ is about coming together and figuring things out together. And it's so different. It's a real culture shift from where we are on our campuses. There, people are very much in silos. People um, are very individualized and um, they don't there's not a lot of trust a lot of time for, you know, and relationships are a little bit fractured. So there's um, there's a lot of work to do, but I see a beautiful culture shift in promoting this idea that let's get together, let's build some trust and let's figure things out. Um, so that's, that's kind of what keeps me going in the work uh, on campus. Thank you so much for that. And particularly about the piece about the community healing and the community coming together to address the harm and moving forward together. Um, I know we'll talk a, a lot more about that, but Amy, a little bit about your background. Sure. So my bachelor's and master's degrees are in criminal justice. So I was first introduced um, to RJ in the criminal justice realm. Um, but my professional background is all within student affairs at colleges and universities. Um, so I started out in residence life, then student conduct, then made my way to Title IX. Um, so I've been kind of reintroduced to restorative practices um, in different ways and what that can look like on college campuses. And it's been very, very rewarding. Um, so now, um, it's interesting because I have kind of a dual role where I am the Title IX coordinator on the New Brunswick campus. Um, and I'm also an associate dean of students where I do oversee the restorative justice initiatives on our campus. We were very, very lucky to receive a grant from the Office of the Secretary of Higher Education um, that helped to fund um, initiatives related to restorative justice on our campus. So we have hired a restorative justice coordinator. Um, I had the opportunity to teach a 10 week course based solely on restorative practices for undergraduate students. Actually, they were all first year students. So that was really cool that now we have trained peer facilitators in um, this process. Uh, and we're doing, um, we're able to do a lot more community work like Julie's office does. Um, thanks to the grant that we received. So I, it, we have, um, I would say we've formally incorporated restorative justice starting maybe in about 2016 into the Title IX process in 2018. Um, but in some regards, it feels like we're really just beginning um, because we are really trying to expand our services and our outreach um, and just learning materials and getting um, the community, the campus community used to this language. That's all kind of happening right now. And it's really exciting. Yeah. And Amy, that's actually a perfect segue. This was not <laughs> planned at all, but this is the perfect segue to my next question, um, which is if you want, if you can just like talk a little bit about what was the process like for you to introduce RJ to the to Title IX um, at the said 2016? Um, and if you're able to please touch on guiding principles, key stakeholders, 
um, any criticisms, etc., that you had to navigate. And uh, Julie, also, please feel free to jump in at any point, but I'll start with Amy first. Sure. Okay. I could talk about this for ages. So <laughs> our campus community adopted restorative practices in, as a response to harm formally, I think, in about 2016. Uh, we really used it for um, bias incidents, student conduct, violations, residence hall concerns, um, that type of thing. Um, so we had brought in some facilitators to train us on restorative practices, um, which was very, very positive. And then um, I moved into the Title IX office and I was hearing from students over and over and over again that they wanted the university to address this issue um, that they've experienced. So the you know, an incident of sexual violence or harm. But the formal investigation process is not the manner in which they wanted to do so. Um, and were there any alternatives? And at the time, there really was not an alternative. It was like, we could have a conversation with the person, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't really anything um, that was an official university process outside of the investigation. Um, and so many, many, many harmed parties were saying, you know, I want this to be addressed. I want this person to get education. I don't want it to happen again. Um, I have questions that I want answers to. Why, why did they do this to me? I thought we were friends, you know, a lot of this. Um, and none of that was really going to be addressed by an investigation process. Also, many of the students didn't want um, a process to result in disciplinary action. Um, so that was when we had um, kind of put our heads together, myself, um, the former Title IX coordinator and leadership to say, we've got to develop something else. And we're using RJ in conduct and other incidents. Let's try it here. So we had brought in facilitators from Campus PRISM, it's an acronym, but I don't remember what it stands for, um, but they were wonderful, led by David Karp and his crew. Um, they came to, um, to Rutgers to do a three-day training um, for using RJ practices in cases of sexual harm. Um, so everyone who went had, had to already be trained in restorative practices, and this was an add-on. Um, and so after that training, we really felt comfortable to launch it in the Title IX office. And it has really been very successful in the sense that we've had a lot of students who request this process, go through this process and feel that it has um, offered them more than what a traditional process or no process, you know, would have given them. Um, so that's a little bit about it. I could go on about criticisms, but I'll, I'll let Julie speak first and then maybe we can bounce off um, one another about the obstacles that we've been facing. Great. Thanks, Amy. And yeah, I would like to reiterate what Amy was touching on earlier, which is just how much time it takes to really get the roots and then build up a foundation. Um, and then all the practices and processes of RJ on, on a campus, and um, especially probably our really huge campuses, it might be a little bit easier on smaller campuses. But um, it does take time, and and people want things quickly. So patience is key, and a long, you know, long vision. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of that, that's kind of how it has been for us in developing. Um, uh, RJ for sexual harm. Um, we had a pretty different route. Our our student conduct um, center, our center for student conduct, has just not opted to utilize restorative justice um, up to this point. Long story there, um, but that so that gets, kind of gets in the way of of operating with Title IX since Title IX and student conduct work together on the sanctions mm -hmm. side. Um, 
So uh, we've always been more focused on uh, what we call climate harms or identity harms uh, with the RJ Center. And so those are the types of harms that um, don't add up to a policy violation necessarily, um, but still cause a lot of harm and, and conflict um, in spaces. And um, so uh, building on that, we we partnered with the Path to Care Center on our campus. And that that center is an advocacy for survivors. That's their role is to advocate for survivors. And they they were born out of this uh, activism that came out in the 2014, 15, 16, where, you know, uh, just like Amy was saying, people were really dissatisfied with what our campus was offering and actually suing, suing and the state level and the federal level, a lot of lawsuits and, 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 um, Things like that. So and complaints um, and and fines being paid actually uh, throughout all that. Um, so we partnered with Path to Care, and it took a while for us to build trust with them because they are really focused on survivors. And so uh, coming out, a lot of people at that center coming out of the um, anti violence movement, uh, they were um, they did not trust people who wanted to support the respondents or the people who harm, right? And um, why should we give any anything to them? You know, they need to be punished, you know, full stop. But as time went on, there was a lot more um, openness to the anti-carceral movement. Okay, we actually, no, we don't want to put people in prison. We don't want the police being called for these cases. And um, and it's not, you know, it, this isn't, uh, our this approach is not open to people of color or LGBTQ communities where there's not a lot of trust in the institution. So that's how we kind of started our conversations with them on what Title uh, what uh, RJ could offer, um, and it took again. It took us a while. We met for a whole year. We created a working group. Um, we called it the Transformative Justice and Restorative Justice Working Group with RJ, um, Path to Care folks, and then people from different. There's a lot of different organizations on the campus with students and grad students that address sexual harm in different ways. Uh, so they. Um, they also were part of that working group and we used the RJ process. We had our shared values. So our develop, we developed values around trust building, accountability, safety, vulnerability, um, and more. And we really spent time just getting to know each other uh, and then started creating this proposal. And as we talked more about it, what we wanted was a pathway that was not Title IX, not student conduct, um, but that would be separate and that um, we we would try to build out. Um, and we also, and th that pathway is not just for bringing together the person who harmed with the person who did the harm, but I feel like the Path to Care folks really brought in more of an emphasis on supporting survivors. And so uh, in the transformative justice realm, um, there's a lot of exciting ideas around, um, for instance, having circles for survival, survivors with their families and friends, especially if they did not um, experience a positive response or a supportive response from family members or friends. Could we help repair those relationships? Mm -hmm. And also using the transformative justice approach of the pods, I don't know if you're aware of that, but like creating a support pod for a person who's been harmed so that they can um, have a group of, say, six folks who they know they can call on. Those people have have said, yes, we're with you. And so whatever they're going through um, as they try to make it through um, the, the semester or, or whatever they're working on, um, and also to help them with resources on campus. So we really had more of an emphasis on the support for survivors. Um, and then unfortunately that proposal is still sitting there. I think what 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 my hope was that we would have the full support of the campus to create this alternative pathway. Um, but that has not come to pass yet. And partly it was because of COVID and also shifts in um, personnel. 
Um, so we at the RJ Center continue to hold processes for people. Um, we do survivor circles and you know, some of that prevention work. Um, and we also can do um, the kinds of processes that Amy was describing. And the ones that I find uh, we are is more of our forte are those cases where it's more of a community situation where yes, maybe two people were involved in a situation of harm, but really the whole community is up in arms. Everybody feels um, impacted. And so uh, the people do have to do some kind of report to Title IX in order for us to take on the case because we have to um, we have to be in compliance with that uh, in, in information gathering. Um, or they maybe they've completed a process already. Um, and then we do a very careful, you know, prep process with everybody involved and then try to bring people together to um, so that they can go on living together and, and you know, have some accountability taking and and um, keep their communities intact. Because when communities that especially of people who are more marginalized, on the campus, when those communities fracture, uh, it's really hard for everybody. And um, so we want to support those communities with these types of processes. And we also work with uh, social services and um, the TANGs, we call it the TANG Center, so therape therapeutic services. We have relationships with those folks as well. Um, Julie, thank you so much. I want to respond to so many so many points um, in what you just said, but I think what that what stood out um, most for me was this focus on the support for survivors, the support uh, pod. Um, especially because um, in addition to being the assistant dean, I'm also a victim advocate here at Cornell. And that's always kind of like my top priority is making sure our victims and survivors have that network. So to hear that there is a formalized process for that is, is really um, interesting and, and good to hear. Um, I did want to go back to Amy because I know you mentioned talking a little bit about navigating challenges or criticisms as, as as the processes were being incorporated. So I wanted to see if you wanted to touch on that. Sure, sure. So I think um, we are very lucky that we have not faced any criticism related to responding to community-based harms like Julie was discussing. We've gone into residence halls, um, we've gone into classrooms, some with the faculty and some without the faculty participating. Um, we've done a lot on the campus related to community harms, and that's been really, really wonderful. Um, we This is a topic for another session, but um, a lot of campuses, ours included, used to do, um, what would you call it, like a listening session or open forum, you know, and it never really lands as well as you would want it to. <laughs> So we have often uh, replaced those types of forums with um, restorative justice circles, and it's been wonderful. So we really have not faced a lot of criticism there, but where we have um, reached some obstacles is where we actually are bringing the parties together in response of an incident of sexual harm. And what I will say is that the students themselves or the parties themselves are not the ones who have the obstacle or the criticism. It's others who have opinions about that pathway forward. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Julie had mentioned this of, of, of almost, uh, you didn't say these words, but I'll say these words of almost being too soft, on, you know, soft on crime or, um, you know, is this the easy way out? for the respondent or, you know, the person who caused harm. Um, and to that, I will say it is not easy looking someone in the eyes that you've harmed and acknowledging that your behavior caused another human being harm and asking them, what can I do to repair that? That is very difficult for, I think, any of us to do. Um, and I want to relay to the audience as well. One of the top criticisms that we also get is, um, well, what about people who want a formal process? 
So I want to make sure that I'm clear that there's always the option for a formal investigation process or a student conduct process. This is just an additional option. So for the students who feel that they want an alternative to the investigation, that's, you know, that's why we go through this process. It's entirely voluntary. So if someone doesn't want to participate, we're not going to do it. Um, and Amy, this actually, um, I'm going to uplift a question from the audience um, and right now, which goes right to what you were just talking about. Um, what can we do when an admin doesn't want to use restorative practices, which goes to kind of like what you were saying that the uh obstacles kind of come from the periphery uh like the periphery, uh the folks outside so exactly yeah. exactly so i would say when you're talking about administration think about what are their motivations um and what is the risk or liability or you know where, where are the concerns coming from and that is how you might be able to um you know, get on the same page about re using restorative practices. So for a lot of college and universities, you know, we are risk adverse and so and afraid of being sued. Um, and I will say that the use of restorative practices often does not end in a lawsuit because you're focused on repairing harm. You're not focused on um, punitive punishment um it's it's very individual there's a lot of work that goes into using restorative practices and so you're really focusing on the needs of the students um and yeah and so you know usually students are very happy or satisfied with the process um so it doesn't it doesn't result in um threatened lawsuits or you know other things I think also sometimes um, leadership or administration just doesn't understand what restorative practices are. So you could certainly point them to resources or explain from your point of view. Um, one thing that we've done at Rutgers is we have held uh, staff meetings in circle and you know use a talking piece and pass it around and that got people Kind of comfortable with the idea of oh this is really cool oh i like this it gives an equal voice to everyone in the space regardless of the level so i think you could start slowly you know introducing the practices without going for the formal we want to handle every violence case with that you know that that might be too much um so i think you, there are little things that you could sprinkle in there um one final thing that i'll that i'll note is that Going, um, going back to the previous point of figuring out kind of what what their concerns are, maybe what pain points are of existing processes. When I worked in the Office of Student Conduct here at Rutgers New Brunswick, um, there was a big issue uh, of students not completing their sanctions. Um, so oftentimes um, at Rutgers, we have an inactive sanction. So something like probation um, or a warning or a suspension, but then we also pair it with an active sanction, you know, of community service or a workshop, things like that. And the students weren't doing their active sanctions. And so what we decided is let's put all of those options for them in a book and let them choose. So we're choosing what the inactive sanction is, the warning, the probation, the suspensions, et cetera. And the students themselves who are found responsible, they are choosing what their active sanction is going to be. And so we've incorporated restorative practices, like little, you know, bits here and there. And all of a sudden they're completing their sanctions because they're choosing, you know, what they, I don't want to say they want to do it, but <laughs> out of the list of things, that's what they're willing to do. And they're doing it. So I think if you, you know, you know your campus best. And so wherever there are, um, Wherever there are pain points, I'm almost positive RJ can help repair those pain points. Julie, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, I think Amy really hit it. I, I, I feel like on our campus, people want to have control and that's because they are focusing on compliance and risk management. I mean, the value system that is the foundation for a lot of 
you know, administration on campus is risk management. And with restorative justice, um, you, you're not going to have a consistent outcome in every case. It's going to be different. I mean, I, I like the way, Amy, you're, you're kind of setting it up so that there's a menu and there's a range and um, and then you sort of know what the outcomes are going to be generally. Whereas, you know, if it's a really pure RJ, it's really up to the person who was harmed. And so it could be it could be anything. Um, and I think that makes people uh, nervous. And um, and so they want to be able to show that there's control, there's consistency, the information is being, you know, shared in the right ways. And um, even now on our campus, we have more, uh, more of a focus on reporting and mandated reporting. And we're all supposed to be called um, campus security um, associates, I think, CSAs. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, uh, it's even more than mandated reporting. There's just, you know, you can see that emphasis comes from really trying to comply with policy, uh, but it makes everybody really uncomfortable, and um, and it uh, and and it's a yeah, it's a challenge. And that's where I would say I would agree with Amy that RJ can really resolve a lot of these issues around risk management, even though it doesn't seem like it because people have control over it and because you're not giving people harsh punishments that are going to make them want to appeal and file lawsuits and so on. Um, but it's hard to get that point across um, to the powers that be. And I will say to Julie that when we have an RJ conference and they're coming up with their agreement, you know, and the harmed party is, is sharing how, how they think the harm could be repaired, the things that they come up with are just amazing, so creative, so thoughtful, incredibly meaningful because it's personalized. You know, they're saying, I experienced this harm and here's how I can build trust in you again. Or maybe, maybe that's a lot to ask, but of the system again, or, of, you know, this is, this is what I'd like to see. Um, and so we've seen a range of things on the agreements far and wide outside of what we could have ever come up with that are just so meaningful and impactful and really end in a much better result um, than I think any other process likely would have. Thank you both. Um, so we started actually already talking about this, um, but the impact on those who are going through the process. So the two main parties, so that's not necessarily everyone else around. So is there a way to assess impact on the victims or survivors? Um, that's something I know when I first came into restorative practices, that was kind of like my biggest worry is even presenting it to a survivor feels like we're not talking about accountability and we're putting the um, kind of like owner back on them. And I know that's not the case, like after kind of like learning a little bit more, but um, I'm wondering if if either of you have ways to assess the impact on victims and survivors. And then on the flip side, best practices for people, for working with people who have caused the harm. Um, so yeah. We do an assessment. Um, so we, once every year, we send um, a survey out to everyone who has um, been connected with our office. Um, we have a, we're a very large campus, and so it's very easy for that survey to be anonymous. Mm -hmm. I'll make the note, though, that for smaller campuses, if you've only interacted with a handful of people throughout the year, that it may not be a great idea, because even if you're sending out an anonymous survey, you might be able to easily figure out who it is. Um, but we do we do have that assessment. Um, but also what we found that's um, a bit more meaningful. Number one is we we get a lot of feedback just emailed to us from students. Um, and number two, we started asking everyone who very specifically went through a restorative justice conference with our office. Um, we asked them, did this conference meet your expectations? Why or why not? Um, we ask, you know, we often hear from students that they're unsure of this process. Is there anything that you would tell someone asking questions about this process? And then do you just have any, you know, any general feedback? Um, and we have 
received overwhelmingly positive feedback from actually both parties. Um, now, of course, it's not across the board. There are um, some people who felt like um, the process took longer than they would have liked because we do a lot of pre-work before we'll put people you know, in a space together. So some students feel like the time frame, um, you know, it's just too long. Um, we've, you know, received feedback that it was really, it was really difficult to do on, you know, on both sides and maybe they weren't expecting that. Um, but overall it's, we've received a lot of positive feedback of, of, um, victims and survivors specifically feeling, uh, very empowered, feeling like their voice was heard, getting answers to questions. Sometimes it, we never prompt this, but sometimes it does result in a very genuine apology and that makes a big impact on people. Um, and for the people who've caused harm or the respondents, um, we, some of the feedback that we get, well, probably one of my favorite feedbacks was that it really increased their understanding and they could see it from the other person's point, other person's point of view that they could not have done beforehand. Um, so that was really powerful. Uh, so we do all that to say, we do some formal assessments, we do some informal assessments, um, but overall, when we're working with students so closely, they're very open with providing us feedback kind of in real time, and it's it, it's been very positive. Yeah, I think because we're not operating at the same scale, um as as uh, Amy's situation, um, I guess my answer is going to be a little different. But I think that, you know, the whole process the, of restorative justice from beginning to end is really about, ta you know, being very aware of how the survivor is doing and what they what they want, and what they need. Um, and so the impact on the survivor, the way I was thinking about this question is, is something that we're assessing throughout every time we meet every time we talk um and the and you know let's say a person says yes i want to do this so you do the prep session with them and then you know then i would meet with the other person and find out you know where they're at i would go back and have another prep session with the with the survivor to talk with them about how i think things are going sometimes it takes like amy said it can take us several prep sessions and really making sure that the stories of what happened align so that there's like a common truth at least you know there's a common truth about kind of what happened maybe there's there's not a, com a complete um agreement on intentions you know because that's that's harder to you know that could be changing over time but um but to get that alignment okay we're in alignment uh, on what happened and and then the impacts and uh what are the needs and so you're you're having those conversations back and forth and really making sure that the survivor is accessing the resources that they need and um and that they have support throughout the process and then as it gets closer to the time they're going to meet, I'm going to keep checking in, you know, are you sure? Does this feel right? Is this timing right? Can you can you bring someone to support you, you know, and uh, and throughout the process and then, you know, on the other side, uh, maintain um, those check ins. So that's um, that's how we, you know, really assessing it, uh, I would say, on our side within the in the moment, in every moment and, and a person. There's no judgment at all if a person says, I don't want to do this. Um, even if they've gotten part way through, it's a little bit difficult. If they've gotten part way through and they've kind of they have a little information about the person who harmed them. Um, but generally speaking, um we just I I tend to do that assessment, you know, in in every moment. Um and it and um it's fine if people want to walk away. And we do have people that come in and just they hear about what we have to offer and um, do the the first prep session. And then they say, you know, this is not for me. And I find that that's uh, often when it's um, two people 
involved in a, like I was saying, I like to do the community piece because if it's two people who, who are maybe in a relationship and they're not in a relationship now, um, it just feels harder to do RJ, to go back into that, to meet face to face with the person um, and to figure all this out. Um, and it's even hard sometimes to call, you know, to, to contact the other person and get them involved since we're not a campus, uh, you know, um, institution, you know, we don't have the same clout to bring people in. Um, and so those are, those are cases that are less likely to be successful, I think, than those where there are community members who can come together and um, support everybody involved in the process. Um, so that, yeah, that's how I see it. Our, our work happening. Um, this wasn't part of our uh, prepared questions, but uh, listening to both of you prompted um, this particular kind of like thought for me. So one of the things that are uh, very difficult, a lot of, most of this process is very difficult uh, for all parties involved, but something that I have heard um, from our, from survivors and victims is that Formal processes often don't provide the closure that they were hoping that they would that would provide, um, and that it also causes them to have to repeat their stories multiple times to folks that they're not comfortable with. Have either of you heard anything different for when folks uh, participate in the RJ process, um, whether they do feel a sense of closure or they don't, or um, do whether they have to they feel like they're repeating their stories especially amy as you said like the process can be quite long yeah so i i mean i'm going to be honest with you that sometimes we've had students say it provided them with closure and sometimes we they say that it it doesn't um and i think that you know everyone's own individual healing journey is just that it's their own individual healing journey. And so this process can certainly aid in that. Mm -hmm. I do think sometimes students feel it will resolve all unresolved feelings and, and it, and sometimes it just doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, I have not, we've, we've done um, numerous processes at this point and they've looked all different. Um, I have not had someone come back saying that they felt re-traumatized by this process or that it has deterred their healing in, in any way. Um, they do have to share their story, but it's in different ways, right? So we might ask, um, you know, tell us about what, what happened from your perspective. What were you thinking at the time? What have you thought about since? What, you know, very... Um, very just, I guess, general questions. Um, whereas, you know, if I put my Title IX investigator hat on, it would it would be, you know, what time did you arrive? What time did you leave? What did you do beforehand? What, you know, like very pointed specific questions that can be quite overwhelming. Um, so I think um, it would be unrealistic to say, you know, you don't have to share your story again or something like that. But I think we just do it in such a different way that um, I haven't heard that feedback through in RJ process. The students generally are saying this felt cathartic for me to explain it in this way and in this setting. Julie, I don't know if you have different experiences. Yeah, no, I really agree with that. When it goes well, for a person to be able to express themselves directly to the other person and say, this is how it was for me. This is how it impacted me. And, um, you know, this is what I need to hear from you. And this is what I need you to do. It's, it can be very empowering for the person who does that. And, um, and, and not everybody is ready for that. So that's, um, but, but it's a, it is cathartic. Um, and it is, uh, it's satisfying, strangely satisfying in the sense that it, it doesn't seem like it should be. But mm -hmm. I also want to add, too, that in the storytelling piece that Amy is referring to, there's so much more that actually comes out. So I noticed that a lot of survivors, um, they've been they have not gotten good treatment from, say, their dean or their 
uh, somebody that they've gone to to try to get help with their coursework or on their job. Um, so they get to talk about that and how the initial harm of the the sexual harm was step one, but then in their attempts to um, kind of get some resources and get some support or um, find their way forward, they they experience other harms. Mm -hmm. And um, and so those we can also talk about and sometimes we can even reach out, you know, to those folks who have um, not responded properly um, and and try to work something out with them or do some tertiary or secondary prevention to make sure that they're learning as well, not just the person who uh, did the harm or experienced the harm. And, and other things too, around like how the culture in the, the environment is enabling harms, how alcohol and drug use, maybe it can be, um, we did one case where it was clear that this whole group of people had experienced some, a harm and trauma and they were all living together. And then their alcohol and drug use was kind of a, a license to then continue to engage in cycles of harm with each other. And so that conversation led to, you know, a, an idea of how can we change our culture? Or what do we need collectively to get out of these cycles? So there can be so much more to the conversation. Um, and that, and I think for me, those are the, some of the key elements also that we we want to keep in mind is how much more we can do to support people and change culture um, and have those deeper conversations through the processes. Yeah. Um, both of you talked about this a little bit, but there's a question from BF that I wanted to highlight. Are there instances where from a risk perspective, so not from a survivor victim perspective, but from a risk perspective, you decline to pursue a restorative justice process? Um, and instead opt to pursue a formal investigation. So for example, multiple reports of harm. Yes, um, that is, we, there are times where we will, um, where a victim or survivor, a complainant is requesting this process um, and we won't even present it to the other party. Um, there's times where we do present it to the other party and we still don't feel comfortable moving forward. So certainly, um, I would say one thing right off of the bat is if the responsible party, respondent, person who caused harm, if that person is not in a place where they can at least acknowledge that their behavior caused another individual harm, we're not gonna go forward with this process. So you don't need to, you know, say that you committed a crime or violated policy or that, you know, you, you don't need to say that, but you do need to at least acknowledge that you were there and your behavior hurt someone else. Um, and that this process is to help heal that hurt. Um, we have even gotten so far as to we've done pre-meetings. Um, we've done the actual conference, uh, or at least part one. We're in, we're in the part of um, coming up with an agreement, and we've ended the process at that point because the the focus all of a sudden became more of a well, let's argue about the facts of the matter, and that's not what this process is. And so we've we've made the decision to end it. Um, some more concrete examples I could give you is we have not yet used um, RJ for cases of dating or domestic violence um, or relationship violence, uh, one of which being um, that we have been trained in a whole lot of things, but not, not very specifically of restorative practices in cases of, you know, relationship violence. Um, and I think we are very cognizant of not if we're thinking of like the cycle of violence, not creating a space where we are pushing people into like a honeymoon phase and then the violence ultimately gets worse afterwards. I hope I'm explaining this correctly. So we have not yet used it. Uh, we actually haven't even had requests either 
for relationship violence case or dating or domestic case. But if we did, we would really have to consider that before moving forward with RJ. Um, the person who submitted the question, I know that they specifically asked about multiple reports. I think that depends on what their multiple reports are um, as to whether or not we would move forward. But that could certainly be another factor where the Title IX office just won't sign off on this process. Um, Amy and Julie, we have five minutes left, and I know at the beginning, when we were first uh, prepping this, we all talked about how we can talk hours <laughs> or do a whole semester or a thesis on these topics. So I did want to uh, provide an opportunity to both of you to say um, some final words, whether it's um, any last thing you want to the audience to leave with or any advice um, you want to give to folks uh, if they're looking to kind of like incorporate RJ practices. I know there have been some questions that are may not be directly like related to what we are talking about. Um, I'm going to uh, drop in uh, my email if, uh, if folks are welcome to email me and I will, um, Amy, Julie, if I have your permission, I'll connect, uh, I'll connect with you for some answers and maybe we can even do a part two at some point. But for now, I wanted to give an opportunity to you for both of you for some closing words. Uh, I can go first. Um, I think for something that we really need on our campus is a more um, robust type of um, series of um, educational opportunities and therapeutic opportunities and engagement opportunities for people who do harm. So I would say that um, it's, it was sometimes, you know, sometimes I feel like I don't have I don't have that much to offer the survivor in terms of processes, you know, these robust processes that are going to be transformative for the person who did harm. And especially if someone is, um, yeah, maybe a, a, maybe a repeat offender or someone who consciously is, you know, like not, not into consent, <laughs> you know, kind of, you know, cause these things come out in the storytelling or, you know, just has have different ideas about uh, power and sexuality and um, and sex and some things that are just that really need a robust response. And so I hope to build that up on our campus or work definitely work with others to to build that up. And there's I know there's great work being done in prisons, ironically, um, like there's a, a program called Man Up where, you know, people come together, they really take accountability together in circle, they think about their impacts, and they also think about how they were harmed, and that this, you know, that they are caught up in these cycles. Um, so I would like to have a student version of that, um, or some other things like that to be able to really lean on for what what can be done to repair the harm how can a person engage in that transformation so that because the main goal right is that they stop the behavior and that they uh, transform their thinking um, so that's something that i just wanted to um, end with um oh i feel like i have so many closing thoughts <laughs> but one thing i will end with is um well, maybe two things. So the first is we're certainly here as a resource. Or I am certainly always here as a resource. And also, I am not the expert. So I would love to be connected to people just so I can learn from uh, what others are doing in this space as well. Um, and this is related to Title IX, but also really focused more on Tier 1, is I think something that's important to keep in mind is that restorative justice is almost um like a mindset uh i mean it is a you know it is there's processes and it's all rooted in indigenous traditions and so i don't want to take away from that um but having a restorative mindset i think is also super important so i think for colleges and universities who are thinking about what's step one maybe the step one is either working within yourself um, or within your community to own up to mistakes that you've made, to repair harm when you were the person who's caused it, to um, be able to say, be transparent and have honest conversations with people about when they've hurt your feelings and how can you move forward. Um, I think there's so many things 
that we could all do in our own individual lives that are incorporating these restorative practices or restorative mindset bit by bit. And I think once we are um, really changing the community for the better that um, all of these processes and things that we've been focused on fall into place. Amy, Julie, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time, um, your vulnerability, your candidness of just talking through your experiences. This is exactly kind of like what I wanted was to learn how things have been for you. Um, and also to our audience, thank you for joining us on a Friday afternoon before Memorial Weekend. Um, we hope to continue these conversations in the future. Um, but again, Amy, Ju Julie, really lots of gratitude from the bottom of my heart. I hope um, we get, we continue to connect and learn from each other. And the same goes to our audience. Uh, please stay tuned uh, for more um, conversations around restorative practices um, as part of the series in the fall. Um, and have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Rita. you. Rita.